Hey, I'm Katie Wawa and you're watching The Record Review. So you may know that Bjork recently reissued her entire back catalogue in special limited edition coloured vinyl and I couldn't resist getting all of them because I started just picking out my favourites and then I was like, oh but wait, why don't I get like Medela and then I was like, oh but I should get Volta then and then I just, I got all of them. So I now have a pretty big Bjork record collection and it's all amazing coloured vinyl and so I thought well, let's make the best of this situation and not only love the vinyl myself, but also share with you guys my entire Bjork record collection because it's pretty big at the moment. Plus, if you hang out till the end of this video, then I have a special extra bonus record, which is really cool that I'm really excited to show you guys. So let's go ahead and dig into my collection. So obviously we have to start with debut. This was released in 1993 and it was Bjork's first solo album, kind of. She had released a record back in the 70s, I think, that was self-titled, but this was her first album as the artist that we now think of as Bjork and doing the same sort of music. Nelly Hooper produced a lot of this album, either on his own or in collaboration with Bjork. He was working a lot in like trip hop with people like Massive Attack, and you can definitely hear that influence in this album. What I really like about these reissues is that they've retained the original packaging. So you've got that sort of iconic cover art and then the back as well. And then the color of this vinyl is is like a beige grayish color sort of meant to represent the innocence and naivety of her first album. For each of the reissues Bjork and One Little Indian picked out some words that sort of encapsulate each album and I found the ones for debut quite interesting because one of them was just mohair which I think kind of represents how iconic that image of Bjork is. But just some quick thoughts on debut. I love how strongly Bjork just emerges on this album as this bright, energetic and playful artist. She's obviously having a lot of fun and there's this perfect mix of innocence and experimentation. Big Time Sensuality is one of my favorite tracks from this album. I like the way that it's like a punky dance electronic song, like a brighter, upbeat trip hop, which is obviously where Nelly Hooper comes into play. And it's kind of cool to think about that song especially in comparison to the very male-dominated grunge scene that was going on and obviously Britpop which was starting to emerge in the UK at the time which was again very male-dominated. So to have this very strong and unashamedly feminine voice just emerging at this time is really cool and I think you really see that in songs like like Someone in Love which sounds very sweet and almost naive and has this harp playing that's very fairy tale like but it's also very strong. The second album in my collection is obviously Post, which was released in 1995. Again, Bjork worked with Nelly Hooper to produce this album, and this was also where we started to see some outside collaborators coming in, especially people like Tricky, wrote and worked on a couple of songs on this album. Again, the artwork on this is just fantastic, like I love it. It's so cool. It is that sort of really bright, positive, buzzing cityscape and Bjork just so confident in the middle there. And the vinyl itself is a beautiful bright pink. It just looks so good when it's playing as well. So Bjork was becoming more involved in the production on post than she was on debut and it's interesting to hear her voice and production aesthetic start to emerge on this album as well. There's a very cool combo of trip-hop influenced beats and then very poetic lyrics and that trip-hop background makes quite sweet lyrics become more menacing and intense which I really like about it and of course It's Oh So Quiet was on post and that is one of the first songs that I remember hearing of Bjork's that I just remember absolutely loving. I think it perfectly demonstrates Bjork's trademark theatricality and playfulness and it's just a really fun song to listen to. I cannot listen to it without smiling and I challenge you to do the same. <laughs> Now the third album in my collection is Homogenic. I think that this is a really interesting album in Bjork's discography because it definitely marks a change in her style. This is the first album where she started working with Mark Bell, whom she continued to collaborate with until the end of his life. Her and him together, they just make these amazing sounds. He was definitely more of an electronic house producer than Nelly Hooper had been. And I think that that influence on Bjork's own songwriting is one of the things that helped her to evolve and become even more iconic. So again, we have this amazing artwork which I think also symbolizes that change in Bjork. Debut and Post both have sort of quite straightforward, powerful portraits of Bjork, but then this is sort of 
subverting it. She looks sort of otherworldly or supernatural. This is the first album where I feel like we start to get a taste for Bjork's real obsession with artificiality and the supernatural and these much more complex ideas. Homogenic comes on this gorgeous bright green vinyl. Another thing that's cool about Homogenic is that it's the beginning of Bjork picking these really cool unusual names for her albums. One of the things that I love about Bjork's albums is that most of them have these names that are unusual words but once you find out what the words actually mean they perfectly sum up the entire album which is very cool. So homogenic means having only one genetic form or like being genetically similar so it brings in those ideas about biology and genetic modification and sort of being the same but different and I don't know I just think it's very cool. Homogenic has less dance beats I would say than Bjork's previous albums but that's not to say that it's completely lacking in like electronic beats. She's just using them differently I think here and we start to see the beginning of these epic and ethereal sounds that I think Bjork has really become known for and it's also interesting to think that this was as Bjork was getting more involved in the production of her albums that this album started to sound more epic. If I was absolutely forced to choose a favourite Bjork song I think that All Is Full Of Love would probably be it. Just because that song is so strong and enveloping and yet gentle at the same time I just think it's an amazing song with a beautiful video as well. It like rises above a song almost. <laughs> A side note, I was recently watching a program on Channel 4 in the UK called How the 90s Changed the World and I was kind of shocked by it because they mentioned Oasis, they mentioned Blur, they mentioned Pulp, they mentioned a lot of Britpop bands and there was not a single mention of Bjork and I just, I did not understand because I think that Bjork is still so influential now but she was also very influential at the time in the 90s and it was really weird watching this program where she had essentially been erased from history. So moving on to the next album in my collection, Vespertine. Bjork's fourth album. So this was released in 2001 and Bjork was doing a lot of the production on this. I love the artwork on this, these beautiful swan designs etched in. This is a double album and both of the LPs are on white vinyl. They sort of capture that innocence and grace of this album. I think design wise this is also the album where we see the emergence of that sort of handwritten typography that Bjork uses in a lot of her work. What I really enjoy and take away from this album when I listen to it is a kind of soft elegance. It's more pensive and slower than Bjork's earlier albums, with twinkling harps and choral arrangements especially in songs like Undo. It can feel almost heavenly. To me it also always sounds kind of frosty and wintry when I listen to it. The meaning of Vespertine again tells us a lot about the album. Vespertine is an adjective used to describe things that are relating to or that are active during the night which kind of makes me think that this is a tale of one magical evening of like revelation and discovery and especially from the video for Pagan Poetry. I wonder whether this is the story of a bride-to-be's last night of freedom before her wedding day. But again this is an example of how awesome Bjork is at selecting words. It's not just her album titles but also all of her lyrics. Every single word is so precise and I just love that about listening to her music. She kind of reminds me of a playwright called Tom Stoppard. He wrote Arcadia and Rosencrantz and Guildenstern is dead and what's cool about Tom Stoppard is that he is actually Czech and he was born in Czechoslovakia in the 1930s and he grew up speaking Czech but he's written most of his most famous plays in English. So even though he's fluent in English, because his first language was Czech, every single word that he uses in his work is so precise and is always perfectly fitted to the exact meaning that he wants to convey. And I feel like the same thing happens with Bjork, who was born in Iceland and grew up speaking Icelandic. And even though she is again fluent in English, she has a different approach to the language. The next album in my collection is Medulla, which was Bjork's fifth album. 
It was released in 2004 and was again produced by Bjork in collaboration with Mark Bell. This is another double album. It also has to be played at 45 RPM, so you get a bit more detail in the waveforms, which is quite cool. I really love the artwork and the hair pieces or head pieces that Bjork wears. Another amazing thing about Bjork is how she is just embraced the like avant-garde fashion world. The vinyl itself is really interesting. It's actually a really odd color. It's this kind of red maroony color. The thing about the color of the vinyl and the name of the album Medela is that the first time that I encountered the word medulla was when I was studying biology at school and we learned about the medulla of the kidneys. And medulla means inner niece of tissue or organ, it's like the inside, soft inside bit of it. But there's something about this vinyl that really reminds me of the colour of kidneys, which is a little bit creepy. But also kind of cool. I'd say that this is probably Bjork's most experimental album to date. There's a lot of experimentation with vocals and vocal sampling, different choirs and choral arrangements, there's a lot of chanting, vocals are used to replace instruments, and there's even a human trombone in one of the songs. To me it's very atmospheric of caves and epic landscapes and sort of tapping into these primal sensual ideas and urges. This is an album where I really start to notice the impact of Bjork becoming more involved in the production and arrangements and writing of all of her music and I think that as she got more and more involved it started to become clear that she was the creative force and like the creative artistic genius driving all of this amazing music. And next in my collection is Volta. Compared to Medela, this is a really interesting change in music style. So Volta was released in 2007 and immediately you can see that it's a lot brighter. It makes you think of sort of house music, electronic dance music. Bjork produced Volta and she also worked again with Mark Bell and then she also had Timberland come in and produce a couple of tracks on the album, which has a really interesting effect on the experience of listening to it. The coloured vinyl that they've done on these is really, really bright, so get your sunglasses on. One of the LPs is like a neon orange red, and then the other is this neon yellow green color. I mean, it is intensely bright. This album also doesn't have a gatefold, but the LPs are played at 45 RPM again. One of the things I think is interesting about Volta is there's this really cool contrast between the way that it starts with these really intense electronic beats, especially from the first song, Earth Intruder, which was produced by Timberland and you kind of feel like oh okay Bjork has gone a lot more sort of mainstream she's gone a lot more into dance music and then I feel like sort of halfway through the album we have this turn and then it goes back to these more reflective slower songs like I See Who You Are a song which is almost entirely stripped back to Bjork's mesmerizing iconic voice which I think is kind of interesting because you can't really play the album on shuffle you have to listen to the whole thing which makes it perfect for listening to on vinyl. When I first heard the album title I thought that it was more to do with like electronic vaults and that brightness of the album but I looked up what it actually means and it's actually a term in poetry. It describes a rhetorical change in meaning like basically like the plot twist in a poem. So you have this turn in thought or emotion part way through the poem and it forms like the climactic center and it's used a lot especially in sonnets which kind of then explains the album as being like we're going one way and then we have a turn and we're going a different very different way from what you expected. There's one song on this that I just find amazing every time I listen to it. It's called The Dull Flame of Desire and it's actually a poem. Like lightning flashing which was written by a Russian poet called Fyodor Tuchchev. Sorry if I'm pronouncing that wrong. And it was used in an Andrei Tarkovsky film called The Stalker. And that's the version that Bjork uses in the song. But basically she and Antony sing this sonnet over and over again in like different formations. So like sometimes one sings two lines, the other sings two lines, and then they each sing it individually, and then they just sing it and sing it over and over again in this like weird transformative repetition and eventually by the end you feel like the whole poem's meaning has changed as well. Okay we're at Bjork's eighth album which probably everyone will remember because it only came out in 2011. This is Biophilia. 
Biophilia was produced basically almost entirely by Bjork. Again, I think there were collaborations still going on and influences and a lot of feedback, but technically it was almost entirely her work, except for 16-bit who worked on Crystalline. This album is definitely a kind of concept album more than any of the other albums, and that's saying something because most of Bjork's albums are concept albums, but Biophilia especially feels like a kind of whole contained world. Bjork actually released quite a cool app to go along with it where you could play games and play the different songs and do all kinds of cool things. So this is another double album and it has a very cool gatefold. The the colours that they picked for these reissues were bright orange, but not quite as bright as the one in Volta, and a kind of transparent blue. My only problem with this album is that this particular LP, the blue transparent one, is very, very crackly. I've seen that a lot of people have had the same problem. Like, I don't really know because all vinyl is clear until you add a colour to it. I think it's just something like some sort of manufacturing problem but i've seen online that a lot of people have had similar problems with this particular lp it doesn't ruin it though it's just something to note that if you buy this and you listen to it then yeah other people are having the same problem another thing that i love about this album is that all of the songs are set in a kind of weird organic it's sort of like a constellation or like a molecular form it's very weird and cool. She actually invented lots of instruments in order to create this album, especially when she played it live. So Biophilia, again, taking our meaning of the album from the meaning of the name of the album, comes from this theory that human beings have this innate instinctive bond with other living systems and organisms. We can't control it, but we just feel connected. It's kind of a, like an ecological connection between everyone and everything. Because of that, this album has quite a, like a sci-fi space feel to it. It could be the soundtrack to films like Solaris or 2001. Like you could listen to it over those films and not feel like it was out of place. And I always feel like Bjork's albums have a character who we are taken with on a journey. And I think in this case, it seems to be like an alien observer or like an astronaut documenting some world because there's this feeling of sort of isolation and separation from the songs. But at the same time, there's like a real respect and admiration for those things that are being sung about. So songs like Virus, which talk about very like natural living processes, there's a sense of separation and reflection from them, almost as if someone is sort of going around taking notes about all the intricate details of them. And it makes you take a step back from the way that you think about these things, especially the song like Virus. Virus makes the process by which people become ill with a virus or animals become ill with a virus seem like a magical, amazing experience and beautiful to behold. And the final album, Volnacura. which came out earlier this year, 2015, to coincide with the MoMA retrospective on Bjork in New York and on her role as a musician and artist. It's amazing. I love this album very, very much. Lee. First of all, there's sort of like an acetate, I guess, extra cover to the album. So take that off. And then there's the cover that's on all of the CDs and is technically the artwork for the album. Vornicura was not part of the reissue program, so this is just on black vinyl. I mean, it's still gorgeous, but there's not like a special color for it. I guess if they did pick a color, it would have been like maybe a yellow or a purple kind of to go with it, but who knows? For the artwork on this, I really love the dandelion imagery that Bjork uses and also and I'll talk a lot more about this when I review the album, but I really find it interesting the very feminized wound that she has on the front of it, because that's very... there's so many things to pick apart from that. Vonicura is structured around the timeline of the end of a relationship, so we see the breakdown, the breakup, and the aftermath of this relationship, which is actually the journey that Bjork went through after separating from her partner, Matthew Barney, in 2013, whom she was with for like 13 years, and she had a daughter with him. So it's a very emotionally intense album. And the wounded character that we see in this album just perfectly captures these depths of despair, especially in songs like Black Lake. I also love that this album ends in a kind of frenzy. You go through the timeline and you think that it might end in a sort of happy note and it's all gonna be all right, but it doesn't. Like, it's not that things are bad, there are just no easy answers to what's happened. I don't know if I'll change my mind about this, but at the moment, 
I think that Volnikira might be my favorite album. I think that it is the most raw and yet resonant album that Bjork has ever made. Most of her other albums have been about her ideas and things that she's curious about and storytelling. And then this feels like the album that is most about a very personal journey that she's had. Also, she worked with Arca on this album, who is an amazing producer who's also worked with people at FKA Twigs. And just the way that he makes music is so fascinating to me. I just so good. And also the Hacks and Cloak as well, who is another really interesting producer. Volnikira is the first album title that Bjork completely made up, which is quite cool. Volnikira is not a word, technically, but if you trace it back to its Latin root, it comes from volnus, which means wound, and cura, which means cure. So Volnikira is wound cure. So I like the idea that she's made this album as a kind of cure for herself and maybe other people as well. So finally, I'm glad you stuck around till the end of the video, because now I have the extra special bonus record in my collection of Bjork albums. This is a Sugar Cube single. This is Cold Sweat. Bjork was in quite a few different bands before she became the Bjork that we know and think of as Bjork and the Sugar Cubes was this quite punky Icelandic band. I just always find it really, really interesting to hear artists that I love before they became the people that I think of as being them, if that makes any sense at all. I guess it's like listening to Elizabeth Grant if you love Lana Del Rey, because you can kind of hear what's similar and what's different and just hear their roots and development as artists. I found this secondhand at Reckless Records in Soho, so a great place to go digging. It's a 12 inch single. The first song is Cold Sweat, which Bjork sings on. And then on the other side, there's a song called Traitor, which is in Icelandic and also Dragon. This is just my extra little special bit of my Bjork collection. So as you might be able to tell, I have a lot more to say about all of these albums. There is just so much to unpick and unravel and analyse and just generally have a really good chat about. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to be reviewing all of these albums. It's not going to be like one a week, it's not going to be one a month, it's going to be whatever order I am inspired and timeline that I can manage, basically. Just a heads up. I will be starting with Volnikira because that's the most recent album and it's also the one that I feel like I have the most to say about right now. But after that, I will just be going on whatever I feel like. <laughs> so if you do have a favourite album or one that is very special to you or that you just really want to know what I'm thinking about it, then please do comment below, especially if I haven't gotten around to the review yet because it might just be a case that I don't know that you want to hear it and you might be waiting for ages and I could do it like next week. So please do comment down below with your favourites and your requests, any thoughts, etc. I would really appreciate that and it would obviously help me to pick the order for the rest of the album Albums. And of course I will be going back in and putting in links to those new reviews in this video So if you're watching this video like a year or two after I've uploaded it Just check because I might have reviewed them all already and then you can have a little look Which will just hopefully make the navigation for that a bit easier I think and if you'd like to get alerts when those videos come out or for any of my other new videos Then be sure to click subscribe if you haven't already Thank you so much for watching this video and also if you're a long-term subscriber Thank you so much for all of your support you guys are awesome And I just really really want to let you know that I really appreciate you know every comment every time I see you guys again and again on my videos I now have this tool that lets me see the people who are like most engaged with my videos so I know who you are and you're awesome and I'm really looking forward to this sort of Bjork project and also to future videos that I'm working on but apart from that thank you so much for watching and I'll see you in my next video bye